Hi, ladies. I, I just want to say I have been extremely um, just inspired uh, by every single one of you. And, and what's great, I mean, everyone's been saying it, I'm going to repeat it. Like, we are so unique and beautiful and diverse. I'm just so thankful that I've met and made some new sisters. So um, just to give you a little bit more information about me, I've been in the restaurant industry for over 20 years. I've done everything. I've got the burn marks to show that I cooked on the line before. I've dishwashed. I've been a manager of a sommelier by trade. Um, and I started my business because 20 years ago when I moved to New York, you almost would not see a person of color in the front of the house unless they were a busser or a bar back, right? You wouldn't even see you know, pretty brown or yellow or red girls at the hostess stand, right? Um, and so I said, that's not cool. And I wanted, I'm not a complainer, I'm a solution provider. So I went and got it, you know, educated, became a SOM, um, started educating myself to become a manager, to run restaurants and open doors for more women and other people of color to be able to get into those management positions and eventually um, you know, also upskill people. I'm a big person on that. So just to give, just to give you a little bit more about that background. So, as she said, we're going to talk about operational efficiencies in practice. You're going to hear some of the words that we've been talking about yesterday and today, but today I'm going to give you a little bit more detail. So this is a little bit about my company. Um, we offer business development, operation strategy, business financing. So yes, if you are looking for financing, I do work with a couple of funders. What's great about the companies that I work with is that if you don't have the highest credit score, so if you have at least a 680, um, I could help you get some funding for your business. Even if you're brand new with zero revenue, if you have, a, a again, 680 credit score and maybe could show like, okay, the job I had previously, I was bringing in this kind of income, I could probably get you up to 150,000. If you have not created your own business credit and you're still using your personal credit, I can help you start developing your, your business credit as well. Um, I also provide tax incentives. Um, so we, you know, especially women, we don't even know that we are qualified to get tax incentives. In fact, I don't see my Flor Tampa, Florida women, but um, they share with me that they got 230 plus thousand dollars back in tax credits. So if you are hiring veterans, seniors, youth, um, formerly incarcerated, or anybody who might be receiving social services like Section 8 or food stamps, those people all qualify for you to receive up to almost $10,000 per employee. If your business is in um, a, a low-income neighborhood, um, you also are, can get tax credits for construction. I hear a lot of you women are opening your second or third location. Before you open that location, please contact me so I can help you get some of these tax credits that you um, may qualify for. Um, we also do staff development. So yes, sourcing, training, recruiting. Um, and then we do have our own trainings, but we will also create a um, bespoke training for your company specifically. All right. Moving forward, so we're going to do a little quick icebreaker. I'm not going to ask every single one of you your names, but we'll get into that in a second. Why do restaurants fail, right? Um, staff development, menu engineering, KPIs, we've heard that word so many times, but I'm going to get a little bit deeper and detailed in that, um, and then generating some revenue. So here's our icebreaker. Why did you start your business? I want to pick two people. Raise your hand. Why did you start your own? OK, my California sister. Um, because I didn't want to work for anybody else. OK, freedom. She wanted to work for herself. I heard that. Go ahead. Because I felt a need for a group of people. You saw a need for a group of people. One more answer. OK, two. You and you. <laughs> the only thing I was good at. Yeah. The only thing you're good at was cooking. Yes. OK. Because I wanted to live, farm, and work in the same place. Facts. Absolutely. I mean, do you see all these different reasons as to why we started our businesses? I started mine because I wanted to create more opportunities for people that look like me and also had the same gender as me. I wanted to see more women and more people of color. Um, and then, you know, think to yourself what you're hoping to get out of this workshop. So top reasons why restaurants fail. Now, the reason why I asked you why you started this business is I have a very holistic approach to business. Um, I'm all about people. I'm all about digging into the deep part of the soul. You know why? Because when it gets tough, you know, like she said, two servers call out, water heater breaks, um, 
you know, uh, somebody might potentially be suing one of the staff for sexual harassment. Like when, when the ish hits the fan, you gotta remember, why did I start this business? Why am I getting up, you know, farming the land to serve the food that I'm gonna serve my customers, right? Why did I wanna work for myself? Why did I, so the reason why I asked you that is because you, you always gotta go back to your why. You always gotta go back to your why. So ownership experience, one of the number one reasons why restaurants fail. Now, what's great is that all of us in here are smart enough to take a workshop and a class, so we're not gonna fail because we took the first step, which is to educate ourselves. I can't tell you how many times I will go to a restaurant and pitch my, you know, hey, I'd love to train your staff. And then I'll say, I also have executive training. And they're like, oh, I don't need training. <laughs> if, if your staff sucks, it's because you suck. So it, girl, if, if your staff sucks, you suck. <laughs> It's so true. Like I can't, I can't express how arrogant we can be in this <laughs> industry. Especially, no offense to the chef-owned restaurants, but chef-driven, where the chef is the owner, they're mostly in the back, so they have no clue about what's going on in the front. Not all of y'all. Don't beat me up. But some of these chefs, they they only know what's going on in the back. They don't even care about the front of the house. They think that it's only about the food, and it's like, well, somebody got to talk to these people. <laughs> so, um, but yes. We're not gonna fail because we're smart enough to take some education here. Poor resource management. Resources, not only just you know, our food products and stuff, but our staff. How do we treat our staff? They are our partners. They may not own the business, but they do own the business. Because guess what? Anybody calls out, you're the one who's gonna be cooking. You're the one who's gonna be cleaning. You're the one who's gonna be serving, right? So, not recognizing your staff, not communicating with them, not treating them like a partner. I love hearing the open management um, topic and touch on that. Like it's so true. The more and more that you are transparent with your staff, the more they will ride for you. Gary Vaynerchuk says it all the time. You cannot expect your, your staff to work harder than you, longer hours than you, because they don't own the business, right? And so if you treat your staff like they're expendable, because I've definitely heard Managers be like, you know, I could, you know, somebody, I could just fire you tomorrow. I'm like, okay. And I've seen staff say bye. And then you see the manager running around because they were so arrogant to like, didn't even take a step back. Inventory management, we just talked about that, right? If you're not paying attention to your inventory, the numbers, and I, I, we can't express that enough, you're, you're going to close. You can't do it by guessing the data. You need to look at the data completely and totally. Mixed customer service is another reason why. Now, I'll, I'll be full transparent. I'm a black woman, and I live in Harlem. I love my black-owned businesses, but Lord have mercy, sometimes my people, we do not get the best customer service. Look at all the black people like, mm-hmm. But it's, it's all about making sure that we treat our customers with respect, right? And also being consistent. I don't want to come in one day, I taste the chili, it's spicy and yummy, and then I come back tomorrow and the chili tastes completely different. Those type of inconsistencies will cause your customers not to come back. Too high or too low of profit margins. You're probably like, how is a high profit margin bad? Well, you might be overcharging, which means they may not want to pay for that, which means they're not going to come to buy it. Um, and we also live in a very savvy society now with food. It's not like back in the day, you can like, you know, maybe put some canned tomatoes in something and be like, oh, this is great. We know what good food tastes like now. We know, we're watching the Food Channel. We, we have our favorite chefs, our favorite mixologists. There's no way you can pull the wool over people's eyes anymore and say, this is an $18 cocktail and you made it with Romanoff. Like, you just can't, right? So, <laughs> want to make sure that you are not overcharging, right, just to get your profit margin, but also, don't charge too low. We're not making any money at all. Um, inefficient, uh, ineffective advertisement. Um, the interesting thing about that is that people will skimp on marketing and training. I feel like those are the two things. People will not spend the money to market their business. Right? You, you're not going to open doors and then just hope somebody's going to walk in. You have to promote your business. And you have to look to see where your customers are. Where are they receiving the information? Are they watching Hulu? And so should I invest in some Hulu ads? You know, whatever that is. Make sure that the marketing that you're doing gives you the return on your investment. 
in a way that you could track it, right? You got Google Ads, you got Yelp, you got all these different ways to track your advertisement. Unfit location. Sometimes we'll look at a location like, oh, it's nice and cheap. It's cheap for a reason, <laughs> right? So just because it's cheap rent, do your, do your market research. Don't be so excited to open your restaurant. You found the first little restaurant spot, and oh my god, it's only $1,000 a month rent. And, but do your demographic research, right? How much do the people make an in income in that area? Can they afford to purchase my food? I won't put my client's name out there, but they opened a restaurant in East Harlem thinking, oh, we're going to get tons of people. But unfortunately, a $14 burger in East Harlem is just not going to fly because they have 13% un unemployment rate. So they can't even afford it. In fact, East Harlem has the highest amount of public housing in all of New York City. So why would I put a place that has a $15 burger? They're not, they're not going to buy it. They're going to go to the grocery store and make their own burger. Right? So do your research when you're looking for your next location. You know, learn about the income brackets. What are some, other, some of the other rest? We talked about this yesterday. What is the competition doing? What sets me apart? Right? Like, uh, what, you don't know, Jen. We were talking so much about you this morning. Like, all the nuggets you dropped yesterday. You know, am I the first? That girl, you dropped some nuggets. But it's so true. Like, are you the first one to do this in your community? Are you the best one? You know? Not tracking performance, we just talked about that. If you're not tracking your performance, you're, you're just basically hustling your business, right? Um, you want to make sure that you have all of the technology things in place. You want to set sales goals. You want to train your team to operate. It's not just you. Everybody has to be ha all hands on deck. Absentee business owners. You know those owners who think they're too cute to be at the register? <laughs> Mm -hmm. I'll never forget this fine brother, fine, owned a coffee shop. I used to just go in there just to look at him and get some coffee. But, you know, he's a Wall Street guy like a lot of hospitality people. And that's a question I want to ask some of you. Why are hedge fund people go, after they retire, to go into hospitality? I don't know why. Like, everyone's like, oh, I used to run, you know, a hedge fund. Now I own a burger joint. It's like, why are you guys doing that? Anyway. Absentee business owner. So, you know, because he came from that finance world and he just felt like he was just too big to be at the register making coffee, his, rest, his cafe eventually closed. Why? We said it already. People buy into you. They can go to Starbucks, they can go anywhere else, Dunkin' Donuts to get coffee. Why am I coming to, you know, Adrian Coffee Co? Adrian's so awesome. She's a single mother of a nine year old. I love her. She's such a sweetheart that they're going to come buy coffee from me because they want to connect with you. So don't be the business owner that's too big to take an order. I, I've, seen, I've seen business owners will stand there and criticize their staff. And then meanwhile, like just doing absolutely nothing but criticizing staff, how slow they are. Oh, you're not doing this. You're not. Oh, do you see this woman? Did you take her order? How about you take that order? Oh, I must be a man. <laughs> I must be a man. OK, maybe I'll come on this side. Um, does this one work? This one works, yes. OK. Um, so unfit location, absentee business owner. So yeah, get in there. Who better to show the team how to do stuff than you? Right? If the staff sees you changing the garbage, they're going to change the garbage. You know what I used to do when I was a GM at a restaurant? One of the first things I would do after I greeted my team, I would go and change the garbage. Then I'd go to the bathroom and I'd wipe down the toilet. I'd do all the stuff that nobody wanted to do. Why? So when I ask them, hey, the garbage is a little full, I need you to change it. They're not going to be like, because oh. Adrian changes the garbage too. So be that business owner that um, is involved. You're not above washing your own toilet. Um, you know, you are the example. You are the standard. All right, staff development. Um, why do, what are some of the challenges that we face with staffing? So they aren't making enough money, lack of benefits. So a lot of times, you know, as we know in the industry, a lot of times people don't get medical and dental and 401k plan, like all these other corporate jobs, right? Um, or maybe you do work at a corporate place like Starbucks where they offer a slew of stuff. But let me share something with you, two things. One. Um, Medical and dental, 401k, that stuff is actually affordable. You can offer that to your staff. 
please don't be the business owner who's like, I can't afford it, I can't afford it. You can. In fact, I do have uh, an insurance firm that I'm partnered with, and I'll be sending this information out um, later this week. But I work with an accounting firm, excuse me, an insurance firm that for almost less, a little less than $100 per person, you can offer them medical, dental, and 401k. So, and it's all about obviously setting your sales goals enough to cover those costs, right? Our staff deserve it. Um, and we deserve to treat our staff with that. Um, the other thing too is benefits do not have to necessarily be the traditional benefit, right? Um, investing your staff in a way, and I probably touch a little bit on this a little bit later, investing in your staff in a way where it's like, uh, one of the things I did with Harlem Shake, for example, uh, we did, I call it social benefits uh, packaging. So I sat all the staff down and I said, what are some ways that we can support you outside of work? So one of the ladies who was a line cook, she said, I would like to improve my English. Another man said, my wife would like to start a business. I want to help her. Another one said, I'd like to go back to school and become a restaurant manager. So I created this entire guide of free to low cost services, resources, education for the staff to take advantage of. I did it in both English and Spanish, so nobody was left out. And what was beautiful to watch was the team would go into the hallway and they're looking at the guide and they're writing stuff down and taking pictures. And so what happened was, even though they may not offer medical or dental, that line cook came to the owner and said, I found an English class. It's $200, can you pay for it? And she did. Investing in your staff in a way that doesn't necessarily mean uh, I gotta pay for this 401k and medical, but you can actually develop them. Because guess what's gonna happen? The girl that you sent to Excel class or Microsoft Suite class is the girl that you can now bump her up to office manager, right? Some people don't wanna be a server or cook for the rest of their lives, you know? Sometimes having those personal conversations with your staff, how's it going? How's your kids? Hey, tell me, you know, what are some goals that you have in the next three years for yourself? Sometimes those personal conversations will allow you to help them. And that helps with retention, and we'll get into that. Schedules aren't flexible. Raise your hand if you worked in the restaurant industry as a server or a bartender. How many times have you closed on a Friday night and then you gotta come open for Saturday morning brunch? Okay, so you already know what I'm talking about. Don't do that to your staff. Don't, don't be that person. <laughs> if they close, don't make them open, right? And then also, if you notice that they've been working brunch for the last three months, like, can we do a rotation? So as a manager, I used to tell people all the time, you will work a brunch. Maybe not every week, but I'm going to rotate and everyone's going to take a brunch. You know, Putting that responsibility on all of us to have to come in a, a, a Sunday morning so we can't even go out the night before. But anyway, schedules aren't flexible. Um, also, like not holding down with the vacation policy. You know, I'm just gonna, I, I will never forget, I was working for, I guess, oh, I don't wanna say the chef's name, but I, I've worked for several celebrity chefs. And I'll never forget the GM, she was so disrespectful. Um, and that's probably why the, recent, the restaurant's closed now. But, um, you know, originally I had just got here from California, I was only like 23, 24 years old, and I was gonna go home to see my family. I already purchased my ticket for Christmas to go to California. And she's like, you know, Adrian, you know, um, you might not be able to go because blah, 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 blah. And I looked at her and I said, I guess you want me to quit because I already bought my ticket. You already knew about it. And now you want to flex on me because, you know, someone called out or it doesn't matter. This is my schedule, my life. So, and also encourage people to take a break. You might have that hard working workhorse. It's like, no, I'm good. I can work six, six days a week, two shifts a day. I don't care. It's fine. Tell them to stop. Why are you working this much, right? It's obviously some outside stuff happening, bills, something like that. Let's find out what's going on with them so they're not working themselves to death. And I mean that on purpose. I had a line of fast order, fast order or short order cook that worked at one of my favorite bars. He went home and he died. I'm not kidding. He literally worked six days a week like a horse. And we don't even know how he passed away. His brother was calling the restaurant and eventually went over and found him on the floor. So let's be kind to our staff. You know, let's give them a chance to take a break and see family and friends. They don't feel connected to the larger business. 
Your team is your team because they want to work for you. They could work somewhere else. They could have another boss. You, you're, you, you, you are the reason why they're there, right? Connect them to the larger business, meaning what are the plans? What is the future goal for the company? So for those who have two, three restaurants or just one restaurant getting ready to open the second one, how exciting would it be for you to share with your team? Hey guys, I want to say that we had such a profitable year. I'm excited to share in six months, we're getting ready to open our new location. Here's how you can get involved. Now people are like, oh, well, how can I get involved, right? I've known restaurants that uh, when they opened their second, third location, they gave opportunity for ownership for some of the staff that have been working for them for like 10 years. And they're like, you know what, I thank you so much for being so dedicated, I'm gonna give you two points in the company, right? So connect them to your vision. Let them know what you're doing. It's not a secret, you know? I, I, let me tell you something. Starbucks is one of the largest companies, right? They offer all kinds of benefits, 401k and childcare stipend, free college education. Despite all of those wonderful benefits, they still are unionizing, right? <laughs> Because at the end of the day, they're not maybe not connected to the larger part of the business. Um, poor management, there's a lot of reasons. I actually did some consulting with them with a, a not workforce development program. But make sure you connect them to the business. Share your dream and vision so they can be there for you. Lack of recognition. It's better to lead with carrots than a stick, right? Let's make sure that we share with our team how much we appreciate what they do. Sometimes a simple like, Hey, you know, thanks for picking up that extra shift the other day. It really helped us a lot. Or during pre-shift meeting, I love doing, doing this during pre-shift. Everyone clap it up. Um, Christina got the highest check average today. Little things like that go a long way. What is it to do, um, who, raise your hand if you do employee of the month at your restaurant. Yeah. Something to think about you guys. Employee of the month. I wanted to see everyone's hand. I only saw like three people. Employee of the month, what is it for you to take $100 out of your pocket and buy a gift card? And just say thank you for being the most incredible employee. You had the highest check average, you came to work on time, and your uniform was clean. Thank you. Here's a $100 gift card for your... They love that stuff. I was one of the top selling servers because I had, so I, I, I don't know if you see the Svetlin, he's awesome. If I ever see this man again, he is the reason why I love this industry. He trained me so well, trained me so well, and he loved in, incentivizing his team. I had the highest sales, so I got a case of wine. Not one bottle, a case, right? Um, and I used to average like $500 in tips at lunch. So then he allowed me to train the team. This is how I made, these tips, everybody, so I would train the team on how to make those type of uh, sales and tips. But just recognizing your team goes a long way. Something as simple as everyone clap it up, employee of the month, all right? Not enough opportunity for growth. This goes back to what I was saying about cross-training. Having that, um, uh, that, that social benefits packaging I was talking about where it's not necessarily medical or dental, but more personal development. Send that girl to Microsoft Excel class because now you can give her an opportunity to become the office manager, right? Maybe the cashier can, you know, let me show you how to do this inventory. So in case I'm not here, you can do it. Sometimes, if you're a one, you know, small mom and pop shop, there are so many responsibilities that you can share with your team, right? I'll never forget this girl said, oh, I'm not gonna be a barista forever. So I was like, well, what do you wanna do? Well, actually, I'm a singer. Believe it or not, that Tuesday night was slow. I said, you know what, you're in charge of Tuesday nights. I want you to book an open mic night. You're in charge of it. Because she wants to be a singer, so why not give her the opportunity to sing? Simple stuff. Simple stuff makes people stay at your job. It cost Ikea $5,000 just to hire a cashier. One cashier. So imagine at Christmas time, right, how many more people they hire to cover all of those shifts and all those people coming in. $5,000 per person. Hospitality industry has some of the highest turnover in employment. Why? Because we treat our staff like crap. We do. We make them work long hours. They have to work during the holidays, weekends. Who the hell wants to work at 8 o'clock at night on a Friday? But we're there, right? So providing opportunity for growth 
doesn't mean that, oh, well, I only own one restaurant, so how can I help them grow? You help them grow by giving them opportunities to show up and shine for you, right? If you don't know a little something personal about each and every employee, you're not gonna know how they can help you, right? So provide those opportunities for growth. Stop hiring outside of your restaurant. They know the culture already. They know the team. They know, hopefully they know your vision. Then you should be able to say, you know what, you've, you've been a bartender long enough. Let me train you how to be a, a, our bar manager. You can manage the inventory, you can purchase, you can also check the uh, profit and loss statement to make sure that we're not over pouring. Something as simple as that makes them feel so much more valued. So opportunity for growth doesn't mean that I have five restaurants and I can take you from server to manager at my third restaurant. That's one opportunity, right? But lack of opportunity for growth also means what am I doing to help this person help me operate my business a little bit more efficiently? And then last, lack of communication. Raise your hand if you do pre-shift meetings. OK. Almost all of you. I should have seen every hand. Pre-shift meetings is the number one thing you have to do with your team. And pre-shift includes back and front of the house, not just the servers and the bartenders knowing what's going on. When I was manager, Back of the house was there, front of the house was together, because we're a family, right? The kitchen needs to know what's going on, and the kitchen needs to share what's happening in the kitchen. Hey guys, we're 86 this and that, today's special is this, it's made with that, I made a sample, taste it, it's $25. We have 15 in, in the register. Sell 15 tonight, whoever sells the most of the special gets $50. Watch that special fly. $50 ain't nothing when you made your, your sales goal because you sold all 15 of the specials, right? So communicating your, to your team, so that's pre-shift, right? If you're not doing it, please start doing it. I, I do have a form that I will be sending out for you to use as a template. It is so important to do a pre-shift because if they don't know what parties are happening, what food is 86, there's nothing worse than coming to a restaurant, you're ordering the food, the server has no idea that stuff is 86. They go, oh, I'm sorry, it's 86. Um, well, let me get a burger. Uh, let me get the tuna salad, but with no, no onions. Now, communication also means communication and knowledge of the restaurant, too, right? So they should know what's in the menu. They should know that the onions cannot be omitted out of the tuna salad. They shouldn't have to run to the kitchen to ask those questions. It's a waste of time and a waste of money, right? If they're sitting at the table for an extra 15 to 20 minutes because you have to keep going back to the kitchen to ask questions, that means you're not communicating well with your team. They should know that menu front and back. Without, they should be able to be like, oh yeah, I can upsell this. This can be omitted, but I'm sorry, unfortunately we can't take the dill out of that. And then they should be able to do a cross sell or suggestion sell, say, well, since you don't like dill, we do have a chicken salad sandwich, which is absolutely amazing. Okay, fine, I'll do that. They should be able to get everything done without having to run back. Ask the manager, well, let me ask, let me ask. All right. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. I'm going to be quick. OK. Oh, go, go, OK, go. Oh, 10 minutes, shoot. OK, free staffing partnerships. Staffing, sourcing staff. All right. When you're sourcing staff, you can source staff at a workforce development organization. Here in New York, we've got the Doe Fund. We've got um, Fortune Society. Um, I know it's Drive. At one time, they had a culinary program. Reach out to those places. Those people have, number one, been trained, right? Number two, are looking for a job. That's why they're there in the first place, right? And they're also usually free. Summer Youth Employment Program. I'm sure they have it across the country. You can give youth an opportunity to get some skill set, but also give you an opportunity to train them and maybe even keep them. And you don't have to pay them. That's free labor for you, all right? Um, culinary colleges, right? They need a certain amount of hours in the kitchen. Get them over there. All right, low cost subscription base. So things like culinary agents. Anybody use culinary agents to f get staff? Yep, I use culinary agents. Craigslist. Um, then there's staffing apps, right? Like Seven Shifts, Shift Gig. Uh, these are great ways to staff, uh, find staff, and then a staffing consultant like myself. Now the reason why a staffing consultant or a workforce development organization are great ways or great people to uh, source your staff is because we can follow up with you, right? I can call you, say, so how's Jen doing at work? She's awesome. Or 
let's say Jan, Jen's not coming to work and she's running late all the time for the last two months. Hey, Adrian, would you mind talking to Jen and finding out what's going on with her? And I do that as a consultant. I'll you know, talk to the, how's her, how are things going? Reason why is because sometimes people um, are embarrassed to tell their supervisor what's happening. All right, conduct daily staff meetings. We just talked about that. Make sure that your team is completely and totally informed of what's happening at the restaurant, what's the specials, what's the sales goal, how do we achieve that sales goal. Provide training. Please stop hiring people and then just throwing them on the floor. You need the, the trainings that are imperative, other than like back of the house, obviously, to learn the recipes and stuff like that. But for the front of the house, it should include your employee handbook because that's the Bible of the business. We all know they're just giving somebody the book and tell them to sign the back of the sheet. They're not going to read it, right? So every single day, there should be a little bit of the handbook read to them or them reading it to you. Um, menu ingredients, train the staff to know the menu. God forbid some, there's nuts in it and then the staff didn't know and then you have a lawsuit on your hands. Um, how to upsell. If you don't teach your team how to sell, forget those KPIs. You're not going to make it. Um, Cross-train positions. Cross-train. Another great way to build your team. If someone calls out sick, Jose can get on the register because just because he's a line cook doesn't mean he can't go to the register and type in some numbers, right? Um, obviously, uh, KPIs know what they are. We'll get into that second. Effect of communication. Don't tell me to fill up the salt. Tell me how you want me to fill up the salt. Okay, and then create track for growth. Um, they should know what is the next position for them. If I do this, I have an opportunity to apply for this position. What is the next, what's the track for growth? All right, historical data. Someone said, how do I track data when I have not been in business yet? Here's the question. Cover your expenses. Your first year in business is covering your expenses, covering that debt that it costs to start your business. So if you don't have any historical data, start with how much it costs you to open your business and cover those costs first. Then after the first year, then you go back and look at your historical data and say, oh, you know, in January we were busy here, but you know, March we weren't so busy. Why? Because now you know how to staff, you know how much food to order. That's the data that you're gonna be looking at. Um, and if you have three years worth of data, that's even better, because now you can really, uh, forecast your sales and also your labor and all of that. Profitability and popularity. If it's popular, do you have the right amount of margins to make money, right? So things that have higher margins, obviously that's the one we're going to tell the team to sell the most of, right? And then you might have a f favorite food item that might have um, high food cost, lower margin, but maybe that's a special because if we sell it at volume, meaning if I sell 50 of these, I'll, it's actually worth me purchasing the truffle oil that it, you know, for me to make it. So maybe that's a special. Maybe that's not something always on the menu. Oh, I see what you meant about formatting. Okay, so these are some of the things that we focus on data. So operations data, the POS system is a great thing. Please don't skimp on that. Even if you have to get a business loan to get a new one, please do that. Um, making sure that it, it, you can check your, uh, how many customers are coming in, you can predict your volume, reduce food waste, all that stuff. Guest data, right? What do they like to order? Um, what's the average of what they like to spend? Where are they coming from? Menu engineering, seven steps to pricing your menu. It's time consuming, but worth the time. All right, number one, list your ingredients piece by piece. That squirt of ketchup, that dash of salt, you know, the little things that you think don't matter, that sprig of rosemary, that's cost you money. So even if, it's, even if it's five cents, it's five cents. List every ingredient. Cost your ingredients out now, right? So a squirt of ketchup is five cents. You need all of those, those pieces of data, please don't skimp, because when you're like, How did, where did that $3,000 go? Well, it went in that squirt of ketchup that you thought wasn't important to add it to your, sale, uh, to your costs, right? Um, measure ingredients per portion, so obviously ounces, da 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 da. Um, determine food cost percentage. You want to aim for 20 to 30% in your food costs. If you're above that, you're losing money. Point blank, period. This is the industry standard, okay? Calculate profit, so pro price of the dish minus the food cost equals what the profit of the dish is. Um, categorize your dishes, most profitable and most popular. 
um, least profitable, but most popular. And that's the one I was talking about, probably should turn into a special, right? Most profitable, but least popular. So how do we make it more popular since it's such a profitable item? And then least profitable and least, pop, least popular, we'll just probably just take it off the menu. <laughs> All right, KPIs. Bless you, bless you, consume tight. All right, gross profit. Gross profit equals total revenue minus COGS. This is the formula you would use to learn what your gross profit margin is. Break even point. So we talked about that yesterday. How do I cover my costs? Or if I don't have any historical data, you at least want to break even, which means you most likely are covering, covering the debt that it costs to open your food business, right? So break even point equals fixed cost divided by total sales minus variable costs divided by total sales. Looking at this equation, how do you solve this equation? We're gonna go back to fourth and fifth grade math. Excuse my dear Aunt Sally. There you go. Oh, she went back to fourth grade on us, yes. Make sure you do the parentheses first, <laughs> then the rest of the equation. I'm not a math whiz. When she said, are you a numbers person? I put my hand down very quickly. I am not a math person. Honey, I will take a calculator and go 12 plus six, just to make sure I didn't mess up the numbers, but yes. Do the parentheses first, and then you solve the entire equation. Net profit margin equals net sales minus COGS divided by net sales. These are the actual equations, folks. You just plug your numbers in. All right. KPIs focused on revenue. Revenue per seat hour. My favorite show is, uh, well, one of my favorite shows is um, John Taffer, Bar Rescue. I love when after he does the you know the new renovation and then it's like each seat will you twenty two dollars per hour love that stuff <laughs> love it right so you want to know how much money is going to be so when somebody puts their butt in that seat how much money should I be yielding per hour out of that seat and that's how and you tell your team this hey servers per, every hour they should be spending about twenty dollars an hour while they're sitting in that seat Five table of five, that's $100 an hour, right? All right, revenue per square foot. Reason why this is important is because you don't want to have any dead space where you're not making any money. So you know that weird table that's askew in the corner by the bathroom and you're like, why is that there? Because they want to maximize profit. So they're like, I'll just put a table there and seat two more people. So you want to make sure that every square footage in your restaurant is making you money. For example, a wine store might have a rack with like 20 wines in it. That square foot might be $50 a square foot. The wine in that rack, there might be about $300 worth of wine in that one square foot. Does that make sense what I'm sharing with you? So that, that square foot, even though it's $50 a square foot, the wine that's sitting on top of that $50 a square foot is going to yield you $300 if you sell that full rack, right? So that's why you sometimes you go to stores, they're com totally packed, especially here in New York in the bodegas and the delis, you're walking like this, trying to get stuff without knocking things over. It's because they're maximizing profit. Okay, revenue per cover. Divide total sales by total covers over any period of time to get your revenue per cover. So if your restaurant is open for six hours, how many people need to come into your restaurant or how much money do they need to spend in order for you to hit your goal? COGS, we heard, we heard this word so many times. COGS, COGS, COGS. COGS to sales ratio equals COGS divided by total sales. Industry standard is 20 to 45%. That is your industry standard for COGS. Okay, prime costs. We just told, my sister back there said primes. And when she said primes, I said, what is that? And she said, it's your list. I said, oh, that's prime costs. <laughs> I just know what it's prime costs says. <laughs> so your prime costs, I put that asterisk because it is probably one of the most important KPIs. Your labor and how much it costs to put that food together. If you don't know that, that amount, you're losing money. Um, so prime costs, right? So COGS and labor together, that's how you create that. So prime cost to sales ratio, so your prime cost divided by total sales, the industry standard is 45 to 75%. That is industry standard, okay? Labor costs, labor cost to sales ratio, 
equals labor cost divided by sales. Your industry standard on that is 20 to 30%. And that is with front of the house and back of the house scheduling together. Um, I have a restaurant owner who runs on 24% labor costs. When I tell you tight ship, <laughs> yeah. So the, in order for you to get to that lower end, and obviously the lower the better, because you're making more money and spending less on labor, is because you trained your team to cross train, they're efficient, they know. That's the only way you can run a restaurant at 24% labor costs. Because people have been cross trained, people know other positions, and so I might be able to have someone do two positions as opposed to hiring two people. They might, they might hustle a little bit more, right? So if, for example, there's some restaurants that don't have bussers. It's just the server, the server's bussing, running food. Yes, labor costs have gone down because now you're not you know, hiring a food runner or a busser, but your server is gonna work more, but they most likely would like that because they're making more tips, right? So explain why you might have a smaller, slimmer team. And especially in a day and age like right now where we're dealing with staffing challenges, the more you cross train, the more you can keep those labor costs down because you can use that same person for multiple positions. Okay, so industry standard again, 20 to 30%. If you, the closer you get it down to 20%, it's because your team is efficient, they're trained, and they know how to do multiple positions. That's how you keep the cost down. Inventory turnover, again, that asterisk is so important. When you know your inventory turnover, apps like Simple, like the young lady who's here talking about food costs and all that, when you know your inventory turnover, you can actually predict how much food you're gonna order. I know every week I'm gonna order 20 pounds of chicken. Now, if you know your inventory turnover and how much food you're gonna order every week or every other day, then you could probably negotiate your price to make it a fixed cost. So how do I do that? Your beef, your, your beef purveyor. I'm gonna order, you know, 30, you know, 30 pounds of beef every week. Now I see you got it at, you know, five, $5 a pound. I'm gonna make you my preferred vendor. I won't, you have exclusivity with me, guarantee 10 pounds a week, but I need you to give it to me at $3.50 a pound, not five. Now, will they agree? They might negotiate back and forth, but you're probably gonna get a cheaper rate because now you're like, guaranteed, you have exclusivity to me. Every week, 10 pounds, no matter what. Bam, but give it to me at $3.50. They most likely will say yes, because you're now a guaranteed customer for one year. They at least got you ordering for one year every week. That makes them look great as a salesperson. You can negotiate that. Don't be scared as women, as they said, like we're so, you know, don't be scared, mm -mm. That beef, I can go over there and get it for, for 350 if you're not gonna give it to me, okay? All right, fulfilling ticket times for the kitchen. By the time that ticket, comes out of that printer, food should be on the table between five to 15 minutes, depending on what it is you're preparing. I was at a bar, I ordered some fried pickles. It took me, took them 20 minutes. Right, right chef? 20 minutes to get some fried pickles? Listen, the longer food sits in the window, the longer that food is not getting to the table, it means that you're not turning the tables quick enough. We wanna get three to four seatings on a table, right? We know if we get four turns on a table, we kick some butt tonight. We know that in the front of the house for sure, right? So you wanna make sure that your team is efficient in ticket times, that is a KPI to track. You can, for all my chefs here in the kitchen, you can actually track if somebody's efficient on your team. All right, Johnny, you're on fries, you're on the fryer, everything in that fryer should come out in five minutes. There's systems like Toast on the back of the house side that actually will track your efficiency of how quick you're getting food out from the time that you receive the check to the time that it hits the table, right? So these type of data systems, if you're in the back of the house, that is a KPI that you should be measuring, is am I getting, what is the turnover, right? It was like four to, four to seven times per month, so that means you're either ordering it every day or every other day, and then fulfilling ticket times, making sure that the food gets out hot, fresh, and on time within 15 minutes, unless they're getting a well-done steak, then maybe it's like 20, 25 minutes. But other than that, food shouldn't take longer than that. Now, server KPIs, per head average, sales-based, this means that your server is really good at selling. They may not be the fastest server, but they probably sell a lot. And the reason why they're probably not as fast is because they might spend a little bit more time with their table, because they're selling, right? So per head average equals total server sales divided by 
total number of servers covers. Okay. The next one is guest per server per hour. This is a volume based person. They probably turn and burn those tables quick. Now they, they may not have the highest sales, but they're giving you volume. They're giving you more people in. And that's most likely because they're not spending as much time at the table. Now, if you have a server that does both, you got a winner, winner, chicken dinner. That was me. I was good at selling and I got you out of my table within an hour because I want my next table. Okay. So the uh, equation on that guess per server per hour equals total number of servers covers divided by number of hours server worked. Now, let me give you another thing that you can look into. How do you, how do you get your team to be more efficient, right? Other than you teaching them how to upsell and all that type of stuff. Um, I'll give you an example. There was a young lady, the check average had to be $20, $20 a check average. At the, and this is at a burger joint. And we taught them how to do it. Make sure you add a french fry, add a milkshake, add a dessert. Don't let them just walk out with just a burger, right? So we taught them how to get to a $20 check average. It was a young lady who constantly always had a $10 check average. The way you do that is you just take orders. You're just an order taker. Hi, what can I get you? Here's your check, bye. No sales, no, you know, can I get you some bacon on top of that? Nothing, right? So I pulled her to the side and I said, do you know what our check average is supposed to be? She said, yes, $20. And I said, do you know that you average a check average of $10 every hour, pretty much every day? Oh, no, I didn't know that. I said, how much do I pay you? I pay, uh, we, uh, we get paid $12 an hour plus tips. I said, I actually pay you $18 an hour once I add all the insurance and stuff. I said, the reason why I need you to do $20 an hour or $20 a check average is so I can afford to keep you at the cash register. I'm losing $10 every time you work. And so I had to explain it that way because I said, if you keep doing this, I can't keep you on the schedule because I'm losing money. It costs me more money to put you at the register and sell a burger than what you're giving me. So when I explain that to her, not that, hey, make me money, make me money, but I need you to do that so I can afford to keep you here. Right? All right. This was going to be quick because we don't need to talk about revenue, but reworking your recipes, right? Um, making sure you have a balance sheet. Shrink your menu down. You can have a basic menu that you have all the time, ten, you know, five staples, and then the, the specials are the thing that's changing every week or every month, right? So keep your menu small. Um, create LTOs, limited time offers. It creates a FOMO. Hey, this milkshake is only here for a limited time. What's the first thing we do with the shamrock shake, right? Remember McDonald's, shamrock shake, we're all running to get that green nasty shake. Um, so same thing, create those opportunities to make people. And when you create those limited time offers, put a sales goal on it. This burger is gonna be around for a month. If we sell 200, We'll, make, we'll hit our goal of like $6,000 you know, $6, this month, right? So create a sales goal with that LTO. Um, customer satisfaction is key. We talked about that already. Make sure you, hi, welcome. Hey, Janet, how are you? That personal touch, let's teach our teens how to do that. And then offer delivery, catering, or buyouts. Uh, there's a lot of people that don't do delivery. And you, you saw the successful restaurants that stayed open were the ones who already had delivery infrastructure already created. Harlem Shake kicked butt during pandemic. Kicked butt, made lots of money. Why? Because they already had a delivery team. They, don't, they, they have their own team. You actually save more money by having your own delivery team. You use the delivery apps for places that's a little too far for your personal team to travel. But again, you need to do the ratio and the, and the understanding like the radius of where these people are. How fast can my delivery guy get there and come back? Again, these metrics can be measured with your POS system, believe it or not. OK, I think that's it. So here's a couple of quick resources. Um, training, there's eCornell University. Your stay, it's pretty affordable. You can um, get your, if you don't, you know, let's say you have a, a star bartender or a star server. And you're like, look, I'll pay for you to go to eCornell and get a management certificate. You know, stuff like that. Um, POS Toast. Maximus is my uh, partner that does tax credits. And that's it. Everyone, this is my name, Adrian Mack. That is my website, MissMackEnterprises.com. My email, you can find me on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok.